the permeable border between film melodrama and the social context in which it is produced and consumed makes the reciprocal impact of film and society particularly relevant to the study of contemporary social issues. In this paper, I will look at the gradual but undeniable emergence of the discourse of civil rights in three films whose classic construction makes them exemplary of the form. Between Douglas Sirk's paradigmatic melodrama, All That Heaven Allows, um, 1955, and Todd Haynes' homage, Almost 50 Years Later, Far From Heaven, 2002, um, there is imitation of life. The 1959 Sirk film, his last in America, that most foregrounds the crisis of racism that undergirds every societal issue in America today. The film can be seen as a crucible in which the repressed issues of the 1955 film are transformed into their fullest expression in the complex intersection of themes in Haynes's contemporary vision. At a time when most of the accomplishments of the civil rights movement are being severely challenged um, in the US, it is particularly relevant to see the progressive possibilities of the melodramatic form, its methods of engagement and emotional appeal, its affirmation of women's power beyond the domestic sphere, and its suggestion of the necessity of active critique. First section is called Cirque on Cirque. In the 70s, the name Douglas Cirque became synonymous with the glossy melodramas of the 1950s, when feminist criticism and film theory rescued the genre from the morass of popular contempt. Relegated to the status of women's pictures, these films have been known less for their stylistic virtuosity and profound critical assessment of society than for their excessive yet trivial emotionalism, their emphasis on sentimentality and their confinement to women's issues and the domestic realm. With the relatively new emphases of auteurism, authorship studies, and genre criticism, creating the discursive field of serious film studies, film analysis, as opposed to subjective opinion, which today sadly has resurfaced with blogs, uh, not the good kind of blog like you're doing, but you know the others, um, Rotten Tomatoes and the like, the films of Douglas Sirk earned their place in the pantheon of cinematic art. At the same time, melodrama as a genre was analyzed, explored, redefined, and debated such that the varied concerns of different readerships and spectatorships brought the genre itself into prominence in cinema studies. More importantly, the underlying social aspects of melodrama's surface narratives provided, as no other genre could, suggestive analyses from a critical practice beyond the films themselves, for a critical practice beyond the films themselves. As Lynn Joyrich, another one of the, the, my memories of Brown, artfully describes, Cirque's texts themselves are notable for the way in which they call attention to aspects of Hollywood uh, cinema, using dramatic mise-en-scene, cinematography, editing music, and performance to elevate rather than diminish viewers' awareness of cinematic textuality. And I would add, end quote, I would add this self-reflexive understanding of textuality <laughs> extends outwards as the critical, uh, tr critical questions about form and Hollywood's manufactured cultural meanings often lead to an examination of the society that these films portray. Cirque calls these textual effects his own handwriting, in quotes, referring to the stylistics that lend what he considers another quote, metaphysical aspect to his films. Um, given the relatively banal material he was often made to work with, Cirque, Cirque's classical background, he studied art with Erwin Panofsky and he references Euripides, Alcestis, uh, for example, um, allowed him to create his, this dimension to his films whereby people could see beyond the surface um, to quote one of his insightful characters. Championed by Jean-Luc Godard as an honest filmmaker in the classic sense of the adjective, Cirque is that rare combination of a director's director and a commercially popular filmmaker. Two of the most important figures in contemporary cinema um, I'm not going to pronounce it the German way, Rainer Werner Fassbinder and Godard again. And here's another quote from Godard. This is what enchants me about Cirque, this delirious mixture of medieval and modern sentimentality and subtlety, tame compositions and frenzied cinema scope. So Godard. I have considered Cirque among the medium's most highly regarded men of the cinema, auteurism's grandest accolades. Uh, but while Cirque is known as a consummate stylist giving rise to the familiar catalog of Circean elements, aspects of lighting, 
multi-layered dialogue, virtuosic camera work, visual iconography, or the metaphoric use of color and music, all identifiable as a Circian system, it is his acute observation of his era and his profound affection for the tragically conflicted people he depicts that makes his film transcend the popular medium to become meditations on contemporary culture. John Halliday, whose foundational 1972 book-length interview in the much missed Cinema One series entitled Cirque on Cirque became the undeniable go-to text about the filmmaker. He has called Cirque the artist of an impossible America. Thus in the 1970s, writing about Cirque um, began to emphasize the ways in which an incisive social criticism took form in subtle but emphatic ways within the framework of this extremely popular but apparently neutral commercial melodrama. Halliday points out that Cirque was able to historicize the melodrama, the American melodrama, building into it a highly suggestive critique of social relations in the guise of an entertaining, emotionally engaging, yet seemingly apolitical form. Other seminal texts in Cirque criticism of the 70s gave rise to a debate about melodrama as a form, a debate that has currency today, to this day. I'll outline the terms and explain, try and do it quickly, why my approach is a sort of hybrid argument emphasizing practical political power rather than contrasting interpretations. The paradox of melodrama that was formulated around Cirque's films can be stated in the following way. It can be equally argued that Cirque's films reaffirm the institutions of the dominant culture, or they can attack and critique those same institutions. So you've got this dialectic. Um, Paul Willeman claims that there is a secondary discourse stylization, exaggeration, intensification, parody that critiques the surface reality of the dominant ideology. This all comes out of film theory of the 70s and this interest in, in finding new ways to enter a text, not just to, to observe, but to, to analyze the, the, other, the, ram, the social ramifications. On the other hand, Laura Mulvey maintains that Cirque's films work as ideological safety valves by demonstrating contradictions in society. Uh, Joel? without reading, really changing them or altering the ideological landscape. I expand the argument using Hanyo's terms and he, his introduction was just so brilliant, um, uh, posed as a question. Can the affective and emotional strategies that define American film melodrama be seen as tools for a future feminist politics or is the melodramatic mode detrimental to such a pr progressive politics? The two Cirque films and Haynes' rethinking of the form demonstrate a significant um, trend toward a more explicit socio-historical critique that when paired with the evolution of the central female character suggests a productive answer to that question. And you'll find out what that evolution is at the end here. Um, um, while all three films focus on a central female character, which is definitional for melodrama, there is a decisive move from personal self-awareness in all that heaven allows to racial subjectivity and imitation of life and finally, to a heightened awareness of America's racism that corrodes even the most innocent attempt at friendship and caring reciprocity. And now for a real treat, we have the American poet, Joel Lewis, to read his poem about Douglas Sirk. I'll, I'll tell you who he is once you, he's besides being my manservant. He's an acclaimed poet of the fourth generation of the New, of the New York School. And, okay. Hello, we weren't able to get Susan Koner, <laughs> so there you're stuck with me. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote about 30, 30. Is he on the screen? Am I on the Can screen? You, yeah, you are. Okay. Yeah, 30 years ago, um, and I've never circulated it because it almost violates the dictum that Charles Olson said that it's all right to be difficult, but you can't be impossible. Um, but this is the right audience for this. It's called Douglas Sirk's impossible America. And it has a little quote from Douglas Sirk. This is a dialectic. There is a very short distance between high art and trash. And trash that contains an element of craziness is by this very quality nearer to art. Sort of anticipates Manny Farber's white elephant art and versus termite art. Paradise is a space between a diamond necklace and its reflection on a cocktail table. Access is a way to plan a day, each particular imparting on the eye's reach. Begin with things, then change them with lighting and perspective. Steam rising 
from a half empty mug, books outlining the Western menu of ideas. And none of the principles see that everything, thoughts, desires, answers, arises expressly from the heart of the social. There is no lasting happiness in the world or quaint freedoms to realize dreams. Hitchhiking through the American winter and up ahead, there's a billboard perched above a viaduct. People can't live alone, but they can't live together either. Say it with flowers, Cirque does. Everyday elements mixed by a crafty redactor. If you wish to remain a not other, then don't forget your galoshes. The sensuality of a shopping list, the vertical geography that maps a relationship, the do's and don'ts of upper class hell, the possible alternate opening, the pearled version of a Manhattan skyline. Once we get up in the air, I'm a different fella. No photos, please. You see, it's only surface. And remember what the old folks say, better a hermit than a sociopath. Always the strange lure of dreams dreamt up by cameras and people. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that was my solution. I read that poem. Um, well, this is the revised version, but I read a version of it when I start my um, Cirque unit in my melodrama classes. And, and as I said, he was considered the fourth generation of the New York school. Um, he was friends with Ted Berrigan, uh, um, Allen Ginsberg, Amiri Baraka, and a host of other poets. So that was a treat. That was my surprise treat that I put in there. Okay, now this section on All That Heaven Allows is called It's a White, 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 White World. In All That Heaven Allows, recently widowed and gasped, middle-aged Carrie Scott falls in love with her significantly younger and definitively, definitely lower class gardener, Ron Kirby, and must face a program from her country club friends and her rotten kids, Ned and Kay. Hers is a personal struggle between a kind of autonomy represented by the wholesome individualism um, uh, the wholesome and individualistic transcendentalism of Ron and the conventional familiar demands of the bourgeoisie and its hypocrisy. But it is, in fact, mainly a film about Jane Wyman's face, as illustrated by the plethora of close ups and Cirque's own assertion of her visual perfection. He says, for, Cirque said, For me, films are an optical thing. The camera loves the light. You have to study the faces. The actor is the whole film. The face is the person, lighting helps. And in this film, Carrie runs the gamut of emotions across the landscape of her face. And yet in this lily white world where people of color literally do not exist, the heartbreaking core of Carrie's dilemma is the contrast of lifestyles. The social articulated through the personal is a question of money and status versus rugged individualism. To thine own self be true um, is Ron's enlightened motto. The much analyzed critique of bourgeois values of 1950s urban America, especially by Halliday, remains encased in a world of white privilege. While Cirque's trademark effects, mirrors and frames, wrought iron partitions and screens, abstractions of light and shadow, musical punctuation, um, heighten both the emotionalism of Carrie's predicament and the societal roots of her problem, snobbery, gossip, selfishness. Um, the cliches about lonely women and televisual companionship are rendered tragically ironic by Carrie's face reflected in the unwanted gift of a TV set. Um, three clips will illustrate and I will just um, talk about them and then you can put them on. The joyful one, the joyful heterogeneity of the party with Ron's friends, a pervasive, pervasive argument for uh, Carrie's flight from the superficiality of her country club set. Um, okay, uh, to Carrie's confrontation with her patriarchy embodying son Ned amplified by the visual and musical effects so associated with Cirque's symbolic critique. And three, the condensation of Carrie's mm -hmm. suffering in the intensity, uh, insensitivity, I'm sorry, that shapes it rendered instantly in an image. Okay, so we would start, show the three clips, one, two, three. This is, let's just maybe get the, the picture and the, and the TV. We, just the very end. I think so, yeah, 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 with this. Yeah, because we've spent more time. Thank you, Nadine. Okay, back to my summary here. 
Carrie will ultimately find happiness when she returns to the maternal role prescribed for her as she ministers to a recovering Ron while the repressed issues of racism and sexuality remain exactly that. Now, the next discussion is titled, I Had a Mammy All My Life. Cirque's final American film, Imitation of Life, is truly revolutionary in that it not only makes racism and issues of black identity central to the narrative, but it amplifies its heroine by making her black and double. Annie Johnson, Juanita Moore, the mother, is resigned to her position of service with conservative values and an abiding Christian faith. And Sarah Jane, Susan Connor, her daughter, is a light-skinned black woman whose desire to pass has tragic consequences. The emotional intensity of their tragic situation entirely sidelines the career struggle of Laura Meredith, Lana Turner, whose relationship with her daughter, Susie, Sandra D, is tested by her selfish ambition and blindness to her daughter's needs. This shift of emphasis from the white Hollywood star to her black counterpart and her doomed daughter is hardly arbitrary. Cirque's intention was to foreground these critical issues. Quote, the thing I was most interested in was the racial angle, the black girl, uh, end quote. The 1934 version of the film uh, directed by John Stahl is much closer to Fanny Hearst's 1933 popular novel, while its emphasis on the career of B. Pullman, Claudette Colbert, Colbert, I'm sorry, <laughs> and her husband, uh, sorry, and her relationship to her daughter, Jessie Rochelle Hudson, is completely consistent with Hollywood norms and the economics of the age. The tragedy of Delilah, Louise Beavers, and her daughter, Piola, Freddie Washington, retains a secondary sat status, a sort of background, uh, theme to the main affective event. Thus, the episodes that are part of the crisis of race, a secondary motif, in, um, light motif in Fanny Hearst's novel, retain that, retain that status in Stahl's film. But for Cirque, films need a counterpoint, something to engage the viewer's imagination. And he said of imitation, the whole film is counterpoint. It's a counterpoint. Sarah Jane is already a counterpoint. Um, end quote, representing a sort of contemporary ethos of the oppressed, my words. Cirque goes even further in the prophetic mode, he says, they want, to, this is 1959, they want a more, well, about a 1959 film, they want a more complacent life, they want to be treated as equals, they want to be treated as human beings. Black Lives Matter. This is truly borne out in the seven minutes of Mahalia Jackson singing at Annie's funeral, and the almost documented documentary quality of the procession in Harlem with um, the heartbreaking little boy in his hat echoing the funeral of Emmett Till. I always cry when I see that shot. In this film and its final episode, Sarah Jane's hysterical tears, the epitome of the melodramatic mode, are entirely defined by the irreducible fact of racism. Throughout the film, there are many insta instances of the tragedy of racial otherness evoked by Sarah Jane's desire and the contradictions of class and race that turn this complex long, longing into societal resistance. A quick enumeration describes the trajectory of Sarah Jane's life. The galoshes, if you remember the line in the film, in the poem, the galoshes that signify Sarah Jane's attempted attendance in the segregated classroom, her parodic strip tease as she tells Susie about her boyfriend, the exaggerated blackness as she delivers a mess of crawdads to Laura's guests, her performances in the sleazy Harry's Club and at the more sophisticated Moulin Rouge, and of course, the funeral. And then, uh, but okay, I would, but the most significant for, for our purposes are the two clips we'll look at here. The beating she receives from her boyfriend when he, he finds out she's black, and the moment of heartbreak when she acknowledges her love for her mother as they both pantomime accepted roles to Sarah Jane's roommate. Okay, so that would be the first. Go ahead. You can go ahead. That's a cat. I had to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Frankie, you're late. I thought you'd never get here. Well, let's walk down by the river. I want to talk to you. We can talk here. Frankie, I'm, I'm having trouble at home. Your mother? Yes. Frankie, 
You said you wanted to take a job in Jersey. Couldn't we run away? I'd do anything to be with you. Anything. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea at all. Just tell me one thing. Yes. Is it true? Is what true? Is your mother a nigger? Tell me. Tell me! What difference does it make? You love me. All the kids talking behind my back. Is it true? No. Are you black? No, I'm as white as you. You're lame. I'm not. I'm Okay, I just um, can you hear me? I just wanted to say that this is unusual for melodrama. It's a little more violent than melodrama allows. But uh, Cirque has noted noted that and he says a very violent scene, and he said it was necessary because of the violence of, of racism. And then the, the next one attenuates a bit, so we get the next sequence. Doors open. I'll be ready in a minute. I hope they're not here. Now, don't be mad, honey. You know. saw me. Was you. You were there tonight. Why can't you leave me alone? I tried, Sarah Jane. You'll never know how hard I tried. Well, might as well pack. No, crazy. I suppose you've been to the boss. Lost me my job. My friends. I've been my... no place. I didn't come to bother you. Well, you won't. Not ever again. Spoil things for me here, and I'll just go somewhere else, and I'll keep on going until you're so tired, so... baby. I am tired. I'm as tired as I ever want to be. You mind if I sit down? Yes, I do. Somebody's coming. That's why the door is unlocked. I'll only stay a minute. I just want to look at you. That's why I came. Are you happy here, honey? Are you finding what you really want? I'm somebody else. I'm white. White. White! Does that answer you? I guess so. Then please, Mama, will you go? And never do this again. And if by accident we should ever pass on the street, please don't recognize me. I won't, Sarah Jane. I promise. I settle all that in my mind. There's just one thing I wish from you. What? If you're ever in trouble, if you ever need anything at all, if you ever want to come home and you shouldn't be able to get in touch with me, will you let Miss Laura know? Yes. Yes, anything. Now, will you go? That wasn't all I wanted, honey. That was only part of it. What's the rest? I'd like to hold you in my arms once more, like you were still my baby. All right, Mama. All right. Oh, Sarah Jane. Oh, my baby, my beautiful, beautiful baby. I love you so much. Nothing you ever do can stop that. Mama? Oh, my Mama. Baby. Mama. Oh, my baby. Come on, Linda, they're waiting. Listen, if you're the new maid, I want to report that my shower's full of ants. Oh, I'm sorry, miss. That must be very uncomfortable. But I just happened to be in town, and I dropped in to see Miss Linda. I used to take care of her. Well, I guess I'll be running along. But please. 
plane's leaving in a little while. Miss Linda. what you call a four hanky film. It's really hard to do the analysis and not get swept up. So this last example is one of the, uh, is the strongest evidence for Cirque's emphasis on the tragedy of racism as the extreme close-ups, the effect of the mirror, the passionate and loving embrace, all elements of, me of melodrama find their purest expression in this sequence of mother-daughter love. And it is really, I mean, it's outstanding for so many reasons, but the, the fact that he sort of highlights this incredible bond, um, it doesn't say, it's not even Stella Dallas that's standing at the, the doorway at, at the window watching her daughter's um, wedding. This is really the way that the close-up and the music are articulated to bring us into the intensity of the situation. And it, um, it's really hard to watch objectively, but you know when you sort of take it out of context, that's what it does. Uh, the last section is called Intimations of Imitation. Todd Haynes' 2002 film, Far From Heaven, offers an opportunity to rethink the woman's film as melodrama is sometimes pejoratively called in political terms that have a broader so social reach than the confines of its category. The obvious reference to Cirque is deceptive, more nuanced than its surface gloss. Haynes is less concerned with updating a classic, a creative uh, reinterpretation as Pam Cook calls it, than with weaving a text about the corrosive effects of racism, social prejudice, and sexual repression. Marianne Doan's summary is nearly perfect. Um, she's one of my heroes anyway. Uh, displacing questions, quote, displacing questions of class in the Cirque film onto race and homosexuality, Far From Heaven situates its female protagonist as the pivotal fi figure in addressing these issues, the figure who must negotiate the constricting and repressive social mores of small town America in the 1950s, end quote. Kathy Whitaker, Julianne Moore, is the perfect wife, effortless in her establishment of the domestic ideal. Her husband, Frank Dennis Quaid, is actually far from perfect, incapable of dealing with his homosexuality and his crumbling marriage as a result. Kathy establishes a friendship with the black gardener, Raymond Deegan, Dennis Habert, uh, and must suffer not only social ostracism, but the realiza realization that true interracial friendship is impossible in racist America. The historical context is clear. 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, 1955, Emmett Till, 1957, Little Rock, 1958, Loving versus Virginia. The good citizens of small town Connecticut feel they are above reproach but they use every opportunity to display their hatred to the extent that Deegan and his daughter, Sarah, in the face of prejudice and anger from both the black, both black and, and white communities must leave the city to start a new life. Haynes paints a portrait of both cultures residing in the same time, but walled off from, from and suspicious of each other. He uses techniques of stylization to demonstrate the growing violence, psychic and physical, that blasts open the calm and reassuring facade of Kathy's controlled domestic environment. Mr. and Mrs. Magnetech are exactly that, a frozen image of projected happiness that exists only on the television screen. But through the turmoil, Kathy exhibits a quiet strength. She comes to realize that her only true confidant is Sybil the maid, Viola Davis, and not her horrified best friend, Eleanor Fine, Patricia Clarkson. And as her personal sadness grows, her commitment to civil rights and the recognition of Sybil's friendship strengthen her. The film's ending leaves us to contemplate, to reassign meaning to the struggles of the female protagonist, both psychic and social. Haynes has said that he wanted to leave um, the, en the ending open, bittersweet and inviting reflection, not because of Cirque's famous irony, but because as John Gill speculates, he preferred ambiguity to closure, or as Richard Porton identifies it, 
one of Haynes' most deeply held Freudian convictions articulated by a character in Dark Waters. There is no resolving conflict. The conflict is the process of life. That's a quote through a character, but it's Haynes. Um, two clips will demonstrate both the unexpected violence of racism with a very definite nod to imitation of life and the emergence of a new kind of tragic empowerment, the strength of a female protagonist whose recognition of the social realm beyond the personal enables her to construct new relationships of feeling and meaning as she embraces the social contradictions of contemporary life. But we, before we look at the clips, I wanted to add just one sort of closing thing for the whole, because uh, the clips are going to end the, the talk, but there is a general conclusion that the preeminence of, of uh, women in melodrama sees a possible redefining of their role from self-awareness and personal in all that heaven allows, that's Carrie's part, to hyper-awareness of the contradictions of race in imitation of life, to Kathy's political awareness in Far From Heaven. The focus is on women and new definitions of the female um, protagonist in Sue. Now we'll look at the, let's see, let's, uh, uh, I'll just, yeah, um, right. Um, uh, two clips will demonstrate, oh, I, I read this already, right? And the strength of the female uh, right, protagonist block. So now we have the first clip from Far From Heaven. Hold on, Eleanor. Eleanor, can I go in back? Uh, Frank just walked in. Of course, you go ahead. I'll call you later. Frank? What are you doing home? Is everything just, all right? Just tell me one goddamn thing. What? Is it true what they've been saying? Oh, Frank, I can't believe you. Even... Because if it is, even in the slightest, uh, I swear to God, Kathleen. Frank, I am sorry you even had to hear such nonsense. Yeah, well, Dick Dawson didn't seem to think it was such nonsense when he snuck away from his desk to phone me today. Oh, he says the whole friggin' town's talking. Frank, please, Sybil will hear you. I sent her out. Christ, Kathleen, do you even have the slightest idea about what this could mean? Don't you realize the effect this could have on me and the reputation I have spent the past eight years trying to build for you and the children and for the company? Frank, I swear to you, whatever Mona Lauder saw or thought she saw was entirely a figment of that woman's hateful imagination. Yes, I have spoken to Raymond Deegan on occasion. He brought his little girl to Eleanor's art show, but, but apparently, even here in Hartford, the idea of a white woman even speaking to a colored man... Oh, please, you just save me that? the Negro rights! You know what that woman is capable of! Besides, I, I've already given him notice and we, we won't be seeing that man again. All right. Is that why you came home? Because of what Dick said? Did something happen at work? Okay, we can end this. And this is the ending of the film. Train station is at the first image. Right now, now stay put, both of you.
the end.